This is the Art of Darkness podcast with Kevin Kautzman and Brad Kelly. We're a couple of very online writers interested in the dark side of what drives creative people to create against all odds. This show is about art and the people who make it, what it costs them, and what it takes to bring something unique and impactful into the world. Each episode, we excavate the life and work of an artist you might think you know. Don't worry, they're all safely dead. On every episode, we try and find out just what the hell was wrong with them and how they worked through their darkness to create something that lives on after them and continues to move culture. Find us online at artofdarkpod.com and on Twitter at artofdarkpod. Welcome back to another fun-filled episode of Art of Darkness. This is a dark room episode for folks who have been following with us. You know that that means we are going to revisit a subject that we've covered in depth already with somebody who knows a little more than us or knows our subject a little differently. Um, um, This time, I really have taken a heroic dose of mushrooms. So I'm (laughs) going to come up so hard in the middle of the show. It's I'm going to interrupt all... Wow, we're setting My, we're setting it we're setting a counter. Just a sweet, you know, we yeah. hit that forty five minute mark. Yeah, this this, yeah, blue, no, this yeah. big black blue yeti in my face <laughs> is <laughs> melting. It's going to start right. talking back to me. Anyway, I'm Kevin Couchman. This is Brad Kelly. Brad, you're going to introduce our our guest for the day, correct? I am. Yeah. And well, and and you've given us a good hint about who we're actually who the subject is, um, and that is Terrence McKenna. A couple of weeks back, we released an episode on Terrence McKenna, life and work. Went into detail with our with our, our friend, the great Pineal Colada. And today we are joined by Adam Dreesey, who is a writer and researcher who has this incredible work book out there available for free called Eden free for free. How much is it? <laughs> it's free. You're telling me that he released a, a 540 page book for free. 578. 578 page book for free. What's it called, Brad? It's called Eden and Entheogens Psychedelic History from the Bronze Age to the 1960s. Wow. And that's what it is. It it, it walks you right through I mean, it walks and we're going to we're going to get into it. Um, But first, quick plugs for us, uh, artofdarkpod.com, patreon.com slash artofdarkpod. Patreon is really important right now because the base level is three dollars for now. But on January 1st, 2023, we're upping the base level to five. The existing three dollar subscribers uh, I think, what did we call it? Kubrick's Moonshot. The existing subscribers yeah. get to keep their subscription, get to keep all their benefits at $3 a month. But on January 1st, we decided inflation, we're, yeah. we're really, we've got expenses. We've got, yeah, we yeah. got <laughs> books to buy. We've got right. psychedelics to buy. <laughs> and uh, so it's going to $5. So if you want to get in, get in now. Well, the getting is good. We've got some very cool things planned for, for 2023. There's even whisperings of a book club that's going to be sure. Patreon only, whisperings of that. And of course, every Patreon subscri- uh, subscriber gets the, the bonus after dark content for every single episode we do. We do an additional 20 or 30 minutes. And that begs the question, patreon.com slash art of dark pod what are we going to talk about on the after dark today brad well i think we'll talk usually when it's a core episode we save some juicy material from the research dark room it's a little different right we went deep we went hard we already talked about a lot of this stuff but i think we're going to dig even a little deeper into what we did on the dark room episode last time talking about whether or not terrence mckenna was in fact some sort of government agent why somebody might think that what uh what other uh have psychedelics infiltrated the cia has the cia infiltrated psychedelics and then we're going to talk about kevin whether or not psychedelics have infiltrated you and i i think and our friend adam if he's comfortable. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure we're sure, gonna sure. do like a, have you heard of a website called heroin fellows i think you might and uh, ladies and yeah. gentlemen and we're gonna have our yeah. own little private heroin session we're gonna we're gonna share some trip stories i'm not saying do drugs kids but i'm not saying don't do drugs do the right drugs never do heroin if you want to learn about psychedelics listen to our mckenna episode but don't don't change that dial just yet because we're going to get into it with our friend uh adam here brad great introduction i'm going to let you take it away here man patreon.com slash art of dark pod 
we're gonna go this is a this is a an episode where we can go deep on a number of things that are fascinating to me but i think it's best for us to start talking about in our initial episode people who listen to us and people who know mckenna are going to be at least passingly familiar with this idea of the stoned ape theory. Now, I think we didn't dig into it. You know, we do a long show and we don't always have time to dip as deep into everything as we'd like to. So we kind of we kind of put a pin in it, described it a little bit and then moved on. And Adam, maybe we can start. Can you tell us, you know, how do you conceive of and how did Terrence, I guess, conceive of the stoned ape theory? What do we mean when we say that? Right. Yep. So um, I, maybe I can just give a, a few notes about my book just to kind of give some preface sure. here. Yeah, um, absolutely. Please yeah. do. Um, so yeah, this book that I wrote, I uh, wrote it about two years ago, 2020. And um, it's it's about Terrence McKenna's stoned ape theory and how that, uh, I think, how that influences the Old Testament of the Bible. And I, and I think there's a lot of interesting kind of interplay between Terrence McKenna's ideas and s- stuff that you see happening in the Bible uh, related to the kind of pastoral nomadic culture um, that is very similar to the kind of Edenic um, nomadic culture that he describes on the Sahara. So you, you see this transference of this culture moving through uh, seemingly into the Old Testament. And so you can kind of pick up on a lot of interesting symbols that don't always get recognized. So that's kind of what I wrote my book about in a big way. Um, there's some other stuff in there too uh, that leans into the the megalithic architecture of the ancient world and stuff. So that we can maybe touch on some of that as we go along. Yeah, um, for sure. Yeah, and so this this first book that I wrote is actually it's the, just the first part. The second part is going to cover the stuff that goes from essentially from the Iron Age to the 1960s. So this oh, first book, really this, okay. <laughs> so this first book. This first book really just covers the Old Testament and all the basics and really sets you up with, you know, how how I conceive of um, the Old Testament culture through the lens of Terrence McKenna in a big way. And um, I I did dedicate my book to Terrence, actually. It's a yeah, you dedication. have the, the great photo of him. On the, I love that. You know, the first leaf. And yeah, no, that was, yeah. when I flipped through, it, I was like, oh, OK, yes, this, this is a perfect yeah. fit. Yeah, cool, cool, <laughs> yeah. cool. Yeah. Yeah. So it was, so I give a lot of props to Terrence because I think he really was touching on something really, uh, really interesting and really significant historically when he kind of conceived the stoned ape idea, which we can kind of touch on a little bit. Um, well, and, so, and Adam, you're an independent scholar. You're a, you're a yes. fellow who decided to write a nearly 600 page book <laughs> yeah, and yeah, put yeah. it out on the internet for free. Let's plug where people can find it. Cause you're on the bird website, yeah. unfortunately, like we are we're all, <laughs> yes. we're all trapped <laughs> on the, on the CIA's yep. mind control platform, but yes, where right. can people find you there? Yeah. Yeah. So you can find me at Aeon Animus and maybe we can link a tag or something in there. We will. It's a it's kind of pun on anonymous. It's just a, just a kind of joke name. So oh, I get it. I get yeah, it. No. Yeah. 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 So, okay. yeah. Okay. So it's a bit of a pun on that. Um, I don't, I don't understand puns. <laughs> anyway, really, I thought you were into the dad jokes. No. Yeah. I, I, I'm into dad jokes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I am. I am. Yeah. Let's, no, let's no, not no. derail. The mushrooms aren't that good. <laughs> You're right, 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 right. Okay. And, but um, yeah, so you can find the book on the internet archive, which is where I, it's just easy to publish there and it's free there. So I just, my goal is to get this out in front of people and talk about it. And because I think there's some interesting ideas that Terrence talked about that we can probably go a little deeper on, um, especially as far as it concerns the, the ancient world. Um, so, Mm -hmm. so that's, that's kind of the setup, I guess, of like, uh, you know, the reason why I wrote the book and everything. So, um, I guess we can just jump into the stoned ape theory, which I mean, I'm sure everyone is pretty familiar with, but yeah, I, you know, I, you know, I think that too, because I've spent hours and hours and hours listening to Terrence McKenna before art of darkness was even a thing. And, uh, I, and so I always had a, what I thought was a pretty good conception of it. But when you talk about it to other people, their thing is, yeah, people ate mushrooms and then they became humans. Like it, it the, they, they cut a lot. They cut like 90% of the detail of the yep. theory out. Um, yep. And it, it makes it sound kind of ridiculous, you yep. know? Yeah. Whereas when you dig into and when you dig into what Terrence, the, the, the process by the, that Terrence walks you through to explain how this could have been, it's actually ra- it's a lot harder to dismiss, I think. Not yes. being an anthropologist, not being a you know biologist or anything, but well, you've got guys like Paul Stamets who are you know openly endorsing this idea, and you know in popular places like the Joe Rogan Show and all of mm-hmm. that, and mm-hmm. so 
and you know, Paul's Paul Stamps is a pretty serious mycologist. You know, he has all these government contracts and all that stuff. And so, you know, he's a he's a serious scientific guy. And Absolutely. for him to kind of give that theory credence, it's it means something. Um, yeah. And that's one other thing too that I another reason I wrote this book is that I think uh, Terence is kind of in this meme territory in the culture in a way where it, yeah, people dismiss him. Oh, so what? People ate mushrooms. Who cares? What you know? Why does that matter? Um, right. You know, it's, he's just a stoner. All that kind of stuff that you can kind of hear. Uh, and different mm-hmm. online circles. Um, but I think, you know, there is some potential for his stuff to be taken a little bit more seriously, but there, I mean, but at the same time we're talking psychedelics. So, you know, it's, there's something mm-hmm. uh, kind of artistic about it innately. And so, sure. yeah. yeah, but um, so that's one reason why I wrote the book is like, I wanted to kind of further his thinking uh, into the old Testament and into the basically all of the Abrahamic faiths, uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, and really uh, kind of really dig into some details, which there's a lot of public stuff on the internet that people have dug into before, but I've, I've found a few unique points that are kind of interesting. Um, oh yeah, you definitely hit some stuff that I'd never, and I would consider myself more than average, you know, oh, more sure. than the average person on the street versed in You'd this. You're a little and, modest, Brad. We've known each other for a good long while, man. You, for sure. Uh, yeah. That, yeah. No, your, your episode of McKenna was fantastic. I really loved oh, it. Oh, good. It thanks. was really yeah, great. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Yep. Yeah. So, so, so you're okay. So, Stone Ape Theory is you're saying that there are basically correspondences in the Old Testament that would reinforce what Terrence McKenna is saying. Is that that's fair? The, is that fair? Yeah, okay. that's exactly right. Yeah. Can, yep. can we, can you kind of, I don't want you to, I mean, people are going to have to read the book to because it's, it's a lot of detail and it's very well it done. Is. It's very well put together and just sort of at times often it's a, it's a verse and then you explaining it often referencing other things. It's, it's really well done, but can we talk about what are, I mean, what are a few things in the old Testament that seem to line up with this idea of stone date that that right. psychedelics are somehow involved in uh, the descent of man i guess or the ascent of man or how, however whatever whatever direction it Which, is we're going right definitely <laughs> yeah that's that's a question too isn't it yeah, yeah. It is. <laughs> um so yeah so there's definitely the the obvious uh the the tree of knowledge uh seems to be some kind of a psychedelic symbol and you have eve the kind of feminine character speaking with a serpent eating from the tree of knowledge and you have this feminine serpentine symbolism which is kind of associated with the Terence McKenna's and psychedelic symbolism and a lot of stuff you see on Airwood actually about you know just the stuff that people see under the influence of these drugs is these beautiful women and uh these serpent figures that perform miracles of healing and all of this so there seems to be some correlation there i kind of dig into that a bit more in the book but um the one thing that's really i think really important to pick up on uh, is the is terence's holy trinity um and now terence talked about this ancient holy trinity of cattle mushrooms and women uh being this very foundational kind of <laughs> in that order Oh. Yeah, well, I, I think it's interchangeable. Each of them are for different things. Kevin. Of course, of course. Right. Yes. Each are for different purposes. That, yeah, let's make uh, that clear. Yeah. Right. Let's hope. Let's yeah, hope. Yeah. Let's make that clear. All right. Uh, but um, yeah. So th- that th- that symbolism uh, is is kind of really insightful uh, because that you see a lot of that in the Old Testament. Uh, the the ancient Israelites are a nomadic pastoral culture who. Uh, live in tents. They have cattle around them all the time. Um, so it's pretty reasonable to assume that in the tropical environment where they lived, they would frequently encounter these drugs. And uh, there's various points in the Bible that you can reference and say, it seems that they did. Um, there's a couple of obvious ones. Um, but um, this, but that the symbolism here between, um, between, I, I, let me, I got to think about which which story is the best to kind of jump sure, into yeah, this on. Yeah, yeah. Um, th- there's. Let's start with one story about Moses. This one's really good. Okay, so yeah. um, there's a story in the Old Testament where the the Israelites are living in their kind of nomadic state out in the wilderness after they've left Egypt, right? And so you might have seen biblical movies about this. And so you know the Bible says they lived in the desert if you read the English translations, mm-hmm. but that's actually. That's not uh, the best translation of the Hebrew. The better translation would be to say they lived in the wilderness. So mm. they lived in a semi-fertile 
uh, area uh, in the Arabian Peninsula, most likely. And they had cattle with them because they're, they basically just left the agricultural civilization of Egypt and they had reverted to a nomadic lifestyle. And so mm-hmm. they're, during this period uh, in Exodus uh, chapter 16, you get the story about the manna. And this is kind of the big story that a lot of people reference that uh, seems to indicate that the Israelites were probably uh, taking hallucinogenic mushrooms uh, because yeah. the manna is basically, it's, it has all of the characteristics of psilocybin mushrooms for a lot of different reasons. Uh, one, it says that uh, the manna grows on the ground like hoarfrost and uh, mycelial networks look like hoarfrost. For anybody who's experienced with uh, how mushrooms grow, you can kind of see this. Uh, oh, so, it's true. And you've got some great pictures in your book that, that get this point across really, really well. And, oh, and when you, you when you, I had remembered that manna story. I remember learning because I, I grew up Catholic and was confirmed in the Catholic church. And I remember in catechism being like 15, kind of knowing about mushrooms and then hearing about manna and being like, wait, are they, huh. I think they're talking about mushrooms. Once right. again, <laughs> the one true faith has it on lock. Just yeah. locked down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. But but anyway, yes, go on. So so yes, this hoarfrost and the, the the way it's described, and it and it doesn't make any sense for there to be hoarfrost and really. Exactly. They're in a tropical yeah. climate, so why would they be encountering frost? It doesn't make a lot of sense. And there's there's other things too. For example, so they the Israelites are living in a nomadic state, they have cattle. And one thing that's described is that there's a, a heavenly fog that comes and descends upon their camp. And it's said to contain the presence of the Lord. This is uh, how it's described in the Old Testament. Wow. And what's really interesting about that is that, well, you know, what mushrooms need moisture to grow. So uh, for the Israelites, they don't know how the mushrooms grow. They, they don't, they don't, they can't see the spores. So they don't really have any understanding of how these mushrooms are um, generating themselves. But when, whenever there's fog, they notice that mushrooms grow. Mm. So they start to revere this fog and they start to think it, it's possessed with the presence of God and the seed of God and it's growing these mushrooms. And it even says in the Old Testament that they followed the fog with their camp. They would intentionally camp places where there was fog because they knew that the mushrooms would grow out of the poop of their cattle. It, right. At least that's my interpretation of, uh, I mean, that, of why that they would makes- do that. That makes perfect sense, right? I mean, it, yeah. I think so. That's I think yeah. that's how you you kind of square that this story, and it's it's described as a as a miraculous food that and yeah, they don't because otherwise because otherwise it's 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 I, I don't mean this to be dismissive. I mean, otherwise, if it's not that, it's a pretty odd story, even even like in Christian lore, it's kind of an like, wait, there's a fog, but how come that fog isn't anywhere else in the bot? Like you yeah. never hear about this fog anywhere else. Right. Right. Except at this, this phase. So it does make a lot, I think it does make a lot of sense. Right. Yeah. And, and uh, in Islamic tradition, and something I'm going to write about in the future here, um, mm-hmm. they reference the manna on three separate occasions in the Quran. And, they talk about the heavenly shade that came over the Israelites uh, in the Quran, or Muhammad talks about this, I suppose. Mm-hmm. So, and Muhammad has an interesting background where he's trained by a by an Ebionite priest who's part of this extinct Christian cult that uh, is very likely associated with John the Baptist. And so he seems to have this very esoteric training from the time he's a very young man. And I think that he learned about this really ancient mushroom tradition uh, from this priest. And, uh, and that's why he includes that story in, in the Quran. And um, I think he was aware of these mushrooms and probably took them himself. He seems to have a lot of indicators that he was. So, interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. Thing. So uh, that's, that, that's kind of jumping ahead a little bit. But yeah, um, okay. Yeah. It's yeah. Very interesting. Yes. But um, so that kind of gives you a sense of the kind of tail end of, of the Abrahamic religion and, you know, uh, the trajectory of how it got to Muhammad. Um, okay. So let's get to the good stuff. What, what yeah. about Jesus? What about, about Jesus? Uh, <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. I'm uh, right. Yeah. yeah. Well, that mm-hmm. does, that digs into uh, some of the stuff that Allegro talked about. Um, and uh, the big thing with Jesus that uh, Allegro picked up on was the, the book of John 
where, uh, where Jesus has the sermon called the, the bread of life discourse, where he says, you know, I am the manna of the ancient Israelites, and you need to eat of my flesh and drink of my blood. And that is how you become one with the father. And you, mm. it, that's the short version of it. He goes on this very long rant. And a lot of the Jews uh, in Israel at this time basically think he's nuts. He's like, he's telling us to eat his flesh and drink his blood. This is crazy. And, you know, in some way, though, you can interpret this like he's speaking as the personification of the mushroom. And this is where Allegro's idea kind of comes in, where he says Jesus is a mushroom. And it kind of comes from the book of John, where he gives this sermon, uh, equivoc- making the equivalence between himself and the mushroom, essentially. So uh, I would just let me back up for a second. So yeah. for audience members who don't know about John Allegro, uh, John Michael Allegro's uh, mushroom in the sacred cross or sacred mushroom in the cross. Right. John Michael Allegro was a, a philologist or a linguist who was working on translations of the Dead Sea Scrolls, is my understanding, when yes. he sort of arrived at this ide- idea, this notion through uh, analyzing what was in these texts and other texts and kind of a. He, he wasn't, he, I guess my point is, he wasn't like a, a acid dropping hippie who kind of came up with this idea and then tried to like retrofit stuff he came across to it. He, he's a guy, an academic who kind of stumbled on something where, for which this theory that Christianity started as a mushroom cult uh, was the best fit. Right. Right. I think, yeah, I think it's it seems so that it gives yeah. it a little more credibility because it's, it's, when I first came across it, I was like, well, okay, you can say anything you want, but, <laughs> you yeah. know, but, but you dig into it. You're like, oh, this guy actually has some standing. Like you right. got to listen to him for a minute. Yeah. Right. He, yeah. He's like a professional linguist uh, in all these different Semitic languages. And Terrence McKenna actually said about Was or about Allegro that it's very hard to judge his case because, you know, nobody knows as much about these languages as he does. I mean, he's like kind of the kind of premier expert on this stuff. So it's hard to make any kind of assessment of it. Um, But he does touch on some pretty interesting stuff uh, related to Christianity um, being related to to this this mushroom cult. Uh, One chapter of my book, I do kind of jump in. with Allegro and Wasson, who seem to kind of really kind of hyper focus on the Amanita mushrooms. And I kind of sorted out this problem that I came across when I was looking at this stuff. Um, I think that there was a maybe a little bit uh, more focus on the Amanitas from the European scholars, because that's a mushroom that's familiar to Europeans. Um, and because it's that grows in colder climates, um, it's not a tropical mushroom. And so when they talk about mushrooms being present in the Bible, they would talk about Amanitas being the mushroom. Um, but uh, Terrence McKenna kind of had a dispute with Wasson, actually, and he wrote letters back and forth with Wasson. And this is published in Food of the Gods. He published these letters in Food of the Gods. Um, and this, uh, he had a little dispute with Wasson where he said, I think you're focusing too much on uh, the Amanitas here. Um, I think that there's a possibility that the soma of the ancient Hindus uh, could have been uh, psilocybin because there's the blue kind of devas, I think is what they're called in the Hindu religion. And they're always seen by cows with these like buckets of milk and all of this. Um, yeah, so uh, he thinks that's a, that's a symbol of uh, psilocybin, which is as anybody who, who's taken uh, tropical psilocybin mushrooms knows this, if you cut them, they'll, they'll bruise blue. So that's one reason why the devas might be colored blue in the Hindu tradition is to mm-hmm. symbolically represent uh, the psilocybin species in particular, which makes sense in India because India is a tropical mm-hmm. climate and these psilocybin mushrooms are tropical mushrooms. I think yeah, the same- must, There must be indigenous or at one time at least yes. had to have been indigenous species of mushrooms in India. Right. And so I, yeah. I think that does apply too to the Middle East that the Middle East was a tropical climate and it was actually more moist and fertile in the, in ancient times than it is today. Um, sure. And it, there's a couple different reference points you can point at and either, it's pretty well accepted. Um, that makes that makes sense. So, yeah. and part of Terence McKenna's claim too is about why the Amanitas weren't probably didn't fit into this sort of matrix was you don't really get 
that high off of them. It's at least right. relative to psilocybin, right? Right. Yes. The intoxication is different. I personally don't have experience with amanitas, but um, yeah. yeah, but I've heard that the intoxication is much different than uh, with psilocybin. And uh, amanitas are also re do require that colder climate. Uh, there's some places um, like in the mountains of Lebanon where I, amanita mushrooms will grow. Uh, oh, okay. So there are some places in the Middle East where you will find amanitas, but um, as far as the tropical areas, like in the lowlands um, in Israel, um, in Egypt, uh, in parts of Syria, you'd, you'd be more likely to encounter psilocybin, I think, um, just because of climate. Yeah. 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 This is a somewhat tangential or, or returning to this, this idea of Jesus, but I thought this would be an interesting thing to interject with. Uh, I heard an argument recently about the nature of Christ and this, this idea, of course, that Christ claimed that he was God and that he was the Messiah and all of this, and how people nowadays will very often hedge around this and go, you know, you maybe say, who do you think Jesus was? And they'll go, well, he was a great prophet, or oh, I think he was a great philosopher. And it's it's some kind of amusing because it's like, no, he was sort of either a madman or yeah. or not or God. <laughs> like oh, totally. he doesn't, yeah. <laughs> doesn't leave much room. So this kind of right. waffling, hedgy, wet, you know, <laughs> and having uh perhaps in Minecraft dabbled with some of these drugs, you you do go on these incredibly um almost psychotic kind of you can I yeah. mean it's it's a psychosis, it's a state of but the 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 dissolution of the ego and the yes. presence of the divine is so there. Um, in any case, I just thought that was an, uh, an amusing argument someone made yeah, recently that is, I hadn't really thought about. Yeah, this is the thing is I think people who've had some reasonable amount of experience with psychedelics when you start saying, yeah, you know, if you, you make the claim all world religions have some link to psychedelic use in ancient times, I think straight people you know, who've never done, done any of these things are like, ah, what do you mean? But anybody who's dabbled in it is like, huh, could be. It could like, be the case. Me, it makes <laughs> sense, actually. Yes. Tell me more. The like, plot the, thickens. You know, yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Like, and what, so what else in the Old Testament? Is there, are there some other, that, that oh, yeah. story is great. I mean, is there some other, a couple, a few other things we can point to that are, oh, yeah. are kind of rich correspondences? Definitely. Um, there's so there's there's another instance. So after the Israelites have kind of been encamped in the wilderness for a little while, and they supposedly Moses gave out this commandment that you know the Israelites had to gather up the manna every day uh, and take this stuff. And one of the beneficial effects of this actually for a nomadic society is the appetite suppressant effect mm -hmm. of the of uh, psilocybin. It's actually being studied for this for diet pills and things like that. Really? Currently, wow. yeah. There's people who are looking at that as as it's becoming more acceptable now. Uh, that there's people out there looking at that. Um, yeah, interesting. So, as a nomadic society, you know, you're living basically off of your the milk of your your cattle, uh, the meat, but you don't want to slaughter them too much because then you lose your herds. Um, sure. And and then some foraging and trade and all of that. Uh, but the, the psilocybin functions as, as an appetite suppressant as well. So it's it's beneficial in that respect. Um, and so they've been living in this lifestyle and becoming accustomed to this for a little while. Um, and then we get this story where Moses goes up to the Mount Sinai and he, uh, he basically drafts the Ten Commandments um, and he leaves the Israelites for a little while. And the Israelites think, well, Moses is gone. He's never coming back. We don't know where the hell he is. And mm -hmm. so they... They kind of go to Aaron, who's Moses's brother, and he's the high priest of Israel at this time. And they say, well, you know, lead us in our worship and our prayer and show us, you know, what we're supposed to do, you know, because they're essentially they're homeless people living out in the wilderness in this new lifestyle that they're kind of unaccustomed to. Uh, they're yeah. used to living in an agricultural society and essentially as slaves in Egypt. Yeah. Um, so yeah. so, the, so the they're, slave, they're looking slavery life has a lot of structure, though. Yes, exactly. You know what I mean? That's right. You know, it's, it's tricky. You whoa, raise the slave whoa, and then you get kicked whoa. out. Oh, no, no, right? no. I'm <laughs> no, I'm just trying to explain well, what could be. It would yeah, be course, traumatizing to go mm. from like, you know. Yes. You know, yeah. Suddenly anyway. they're, suddenly yeah, they're I, like I remember totally grad school. Uh, leaving yeah. grad school was really yeah. rough. <laughs> right, right. I mean, yeah, there's that. Yeah, I know that experience too, for sure. Leaving uh, yeah. a good school, yeah. you know. Yeah, um, you're like, uh-oh. Okay, take yep. care of myself. Off the reservation. <laughs> yeah, yep, exactly. So that yeah. that experience. So, okay, so they go. So they go to Aaron, 
they yeah. and they need guidance because obviously they need somebody to lead them or lead them tell them what to do or help them figure out what right to do. exactly so and what and so then Aaron what he does is he constructs the golden calf right he creates the idol and this becomes this big story in the old testament where now the Israelites start worshiping this golden calf okay and here we're seeing Terence McKenna's symbolism mm -hmm. he, this is the ancient uh, cow symbolism of this of this uh, stoned ape culture. And when Moses comes down from the mountain and he sees the Israelites, it says in the Bible that they're fornicating, they're dancing, they're listening to music. And I think they're probably taking drugs because they had al already shown that they're identifying the manna. So mm. at this moment, what you see is Aaron's trying to revert to this pastoral religion in some way. And mm -hmm. he's sincerely Some dim memory. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. He's sincerely making an effort at it. And so they construct the golden calf, but this displeases Moses. And then he, he gathers the Levites around. And he says, rise up and take your sword up against your brother. And they have this little civil war here until yeah. Moses reestablishes the kind of um, the, the monotheism without images, which is a big part of the, the old Testament tradition is that God is formless and it's the spiritual entity. And this is a big part of the doctrine uh, in the Old Testament. And it's, it becomes a big part of Islam as well, too. Um, and yeah, I mean, to this to day, extent. you know, yes. Christianity, we've, we've sort of the Judeo Christian world or the Christian world has kind of accepted it's okay to try and depict God. But, but, <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. The, right. the, but the Protestants, you know, return to this stripped thing too it seems to be kind yes. of a natural vibe that that happens within the abrahamic religions i of course uh, profess the one true faith so i am <laughs> sure. uh, i'm perfectly yeah. happy with lots of idolatry That's and, Scientolo uh, scientology right <laughs> right of course <laughs> indeed. yeah okay. what people don't right. know is that every one of these darkroom episodes is an audit you're going to be clear yeah. when oh. we're done here adam <laughs> oh okay very good very good <laughs> your thetans are, are, are coming down as we as we speak <laughs> right on a science a Scientology audit. I got it. I got it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, this yeah. this makes it. Yeah. This is so. Well, I'm sorry. Continue. So we've got. I, I'm really interested in this idea, and this gives me the 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 idea of the golden calf. I hadn't realized that Aaron. I mean, I, I guess I'm not as hip to my Bible stories as I thought. I hadn't realized that it was actually Aaron who created the golden calf, and that it was like this deliberate attempt to try and restore some kind of order. That's 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 really interesting, and you can yeah. see, him, and you're. And you're right, it does build in because one thing Terrence McKenna talked about in the stoned ape theory was like, okay, well, at certain dosages, you know, too high a dosage, a heroic dose of mushrooms, there's not a lot of fornicating going on. But at right. mild to moderate doses, there's central nervous system simulation and everybody's sleeping with everybody, um, yeah. which is good for pop for the population right really i mean in a sense if you're trying to grow your population yes definitely yeah, that's what you that's what that's what that's what you might want a little growth spurt could be quite good um yep. you know there's reasons to not have that happen also but um mm -hmm. so that's 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 quite interesting and then the and then also you know he terrence talked about another thing that would tap into it what, what would cause a a shift in societal organization was that if you are populating this way and you're basically blurring the line between whose children belong to which man. And so yeah. it kind of dilutes the ability. It dilutes like real strict patriarchal hierarchy from developing. Right. Exactly. Because, because yeah. men don't know everybody's babies is everybody's. It's a, it's a little bit, it's a little bit more. You're know, talking about orgies. The word. You're talking about yeah. uh, mushroom orgies. Okay. Yep. Right. Okay. But right. yeah, but Terrence McKenna would position this in a specific point in human history, right? In human in the development of, of mankind, hmm. right? Uh, saying whether we should do it again now. I mean, he might have advocated that too. <laughs> right. And this is right. an interesting point where um you're really touching on a really interesting point about uh, Terrence's ideas and maybe some differences with biblical theology here. So mm -hmm. I think this is the reason why Moses gets really pissed off about this, actually, because the whole organizational principle of Israelite society was the patriarchal bloodlines of the 12 tribes. So the whole organizational principle was that you could trace your lineage back to one of the 12 inheritors of, of Jacob, who is the kind of grand patriarch, who is the grandson of a Abraham. So, and that was essentially the organizational principle in how each tribe organized themselves, even as far as their military was concerned, they numbered their military according to the tribal houses that are, so there were 12 tribal houses and essentially a confederation. 
So when you have this orgy going on, then it's actually dissolving the, the structure of, of, of Moses's system. So, and the, and the tribal judges as well were established according to each tribe. So the tribes were judging themselves and there was this very uh, coherent system of order uh, that, that came out of these patriarchal bloodlines. And this is, this does show a little difference with Terence's thought about the stone ape culture and maybe the ideal um, of, of the stone ape culture, which is orgiastic, I think in his interpretation. Um, yeah. I, but I'm not convinced uh, I think I think that in some ways the the understanding of these patriarchal bloodlines actually did facilitate a certain level of social organization, and that the the people who were taking these mushrooms would have recognized that that there, there's a social organizational principle uh, at work here that you can leverage if you can keep track of your uh, your patriarchal lines. Sure. Yeah. Sure. So um, so there's a little difference there, um, and you know, so um, I'm not. I'm not. Sh- I'm not sure. I totally agree with the orgiastic approach personally, uh, but sure. um, yeah, because I think that there, there uh, it does. We make are sense. we are looking for new Patreon levels all the time. So yeah. <laughs> oh sure. Sure. Yeah. Twenty five dollar a month. You yeah, fifty dollar a month key party. Right. <laughs> the orgy oh right. Is anybody oh is God. anybody doing that yet? Uh, <laughs> I can't. I'm gonna funny. let you. I'm gonna, yeah, I'm Brad's, gonna let you. Brad's mad. I told you the mushrooms yeah. are. You know, they're. I'm really <laughs> starting to peak. <laughs> Right, right, right. right. Yeah. This, this is this is fascinating, and it's so funny because Brad, you keep asking little questions like maybe there's more, maybe there's more, and I just yeah. want to remind you and and our listeners that uh, Adam's book is 570 pages long and free yeah, online. Yeah. So yes, there is yeah. more. There's plenty more yeah. uh, where where this came from. If you're into this, yeah, I just like yeah. pulling out, kind of trying to pull out a few, and I I mean I know there's a bunch in there that I kind of came across. Um, one thing I do kind of want to touch on briefly is how does or does it how does dmt fit into any of this i know there's a lot of there's a lot of mushroom stuff and a lot of i think there's a lot of stuff in the bible uh, clearly there's a lot of stuff in the bible that you can see mushrooms in it can we see dmt can we see ayahuasca analogs in the bible any place sure yeah and i don't touch on this a whole lot in my book because i am i'm a little partial to uh psilocybin uh kalindi ee I'm probably pronouncing his name wrong, but mm-hmm. he's a yeah, guy who, who's very, uh, who he kind of developed this idea of, you know, about how mushrooms are just very bio accessible. So it's, mm-hmm. it's very natural to assume that you're going to find mushrooms in more cultures than these more complicated mixtures uh, that require, sure. you know, distilling, boiling, all this kind of stuff. Um, mm-hmm. But it's possible that uh, the acacia tree, which has, uh, I think it's seeds and its root bark has a, uh, has high uh, DMT concentration that they could have been extracting that and using that. Um, sure. They use acacia wood for the Ark of the Ark of the Covenant, um, so they seem to have a kind of sacred relationship with the acacia tree in some capacity. Uh, yeah, and there was a there was a there there's a Bible passage, and I, I I'm clearly not as well read on this stuff oh, as you are. No, I, no, no. There's a Bible passage about burning acacia wood in a chamber somewhere in the Old Testament. I don't know if this was David, um, uh, hmm. which I had it at my I think fingertips. It's just occurring to you me. Might, but anyway, it's possible you're referencing the burning bush situation oh, with Moses. Well, there's there's that. Now, I now that is something that all the DMT folks always said. Well, that's yep. clearly he was burning acacia, but it kind of doesn't make sense that you're burning an acacia bush out in the middle of. I can actually touch on this. Okay, please yeah. do. Yeah, yeah, I can touch on this a little bit. Um, so. Yeah, so that so when Moses has his burning bush experience, this is actually kind of the the thing that starts his whole journey to liberate the the Israelites. Um, it's kind of this prophetic vision where God comes and talks to him and basically tells him about how all these events are going to unfold. You know, there's a case that well, the biblical scholars just retroactively wrote in what actually happened. You know, he didn't see the future. You know, that's the secular view that you're going to hear from people. But I think there is a way we can look at this where there's some kind of it's possible there was a genuine prophetic vision. And the details of how this happened is interesting. So in the in the Old Testament, it says uh when Moses, right before Moses has this encounter with the burning bush, he's taking care of a flock of sheep uh for his father-in-law Jethro who is called the high priest of the Midianites. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, and the, uh, the Midianites were an Abrahamic tribe. Midian was a son of Abraham. So they're actually related by blood to the Israelites. 
this oh, tribe. Okay. So he Moses marries into this tribe after he's exiled uh, from from Egypt, and he ends up taking care of this high priest's flock of sheep. And it's reasonable to assume that he actually encountered psilocybin just before he had this esoteric encounter with God. And one reason to think this too is because it says, uh, when it refers to the burning bush, it says that the bush was burning, but not consumed by the flame. So it seems like there's some kind of a hallucination happening. There's something that's not sure. real going on already when this vision is is happening. Uh, so that's a that's one layer of this. And what's really interesting too about this is he's living in the, the land of Midian at this time. And this is actually the same territory, the same location where the Israelites later come back and identify the manna. It's it's in that same place. So oh. yeah. So and you can you can actually kind of trace the biblical literature on this and it and it, it's the same spot. So um, hmm. And another name for that area, or maybe a neighboring area that's very close, is the wilderness of sin, which is um, it, it means the wilderness. Kevin, you spent the, some time there, didn't you? Uh, oh, recently, recently. <laughs> recently. I'm, I'm, I'm looking, yeah. to, looking forward to going back. <laughs> right, right. It's not the same sin as uh, as yeah. like you know sin in the in the in the Christian I, tradition. Uh, I love oh, okay. the fact that like we're what 30, 40 minutes into this episode, yeah. and we already have like eight great names for prog rock albums <laughs> ah, yes <laughs> the wilderness of sin is good yeah <laughs> yeah, for sure. yes. yeah. yeah robert wilderness Furry, of sin. Trip. Yeah. yeah just yeah, <laughs> that's very great good. that's very great good. <laughs> so so okay so so you're so that makes sense to me and in 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 I am glad you you were able to kind of link it to mushrooms instead, because I always as much as I wanted to believe in the DMT burning the acacia bush DMT, it just never made it never quite squared with what I yeah. uh, know in Minecraft about DMT and DMT containing plants. Right, right. Yeah. It, it just it seems a little bit more plausible. And uh, it's just mm -hmm. the mushrooms are just more naturally available too for a nomadic sure. society. It makes sense that they'd encounter these more frequently. Um, so, so that's one piece of that. Um, there's, there's some details related to the wilderness of sin. I'll just touch on this because it's kind of interesting and it gets into some of the more uh, archeological historical stuff. Um, this was, um, so sin in ancient Sumerian uh, and even in ancient Egyptian too, was a, was a, was a lunar goddess or a lunar God. It depends. Oh. Um, so it was a moon God. And there's a really interesting reason why that's the case, and it has to do with the Exodus. Now, we all know about the miracle of Moses parting the Red Sea, right? You know, he lifts up his staff and the, and the sea parts. Uh, there's an interesting interpretation of what happened here um, that's kind of actually depicted in a recent movie called uh, Exodus Gods and Kings. I don't know if you guys have seen that, but uh, it was a Ridley Scott film. Uh, biblical movie about Moses and the book of huh. Exodus. It's really, I did really not good. know that. Interesting. Ridley Scott I, made a, a fascinating. Oh, yeah. hmm. oh I, apparently there's an extended version with like 40 minutes that he hasn't released yet. I hope he releases it someday, but um, yeah. anyways, uh, yeah. so this movie explains this naturalistic theory of how the Exodus might've happened. And essentially the idea is that there might've been a tsunami that happened like just serendipitously where the sea receded the Israelites crossed over this, this land bridge um, across the Red Sea. And as the Egyptians are chasing them across the Red Sea, the tsunami came back and knocked mm -hmm. over these Egyptian chariots. Um, it might, my interpretation is that it might not have had to be a tsunami. This could have been a seasonal thing, actually, that happened with the tidal shifts. Um, even mm -hmm. uh, a full moon, you know, forcing the tides back with you know, considerable force. It would have made it impossible for the Egyptians to chase after the Israelites, um, sure, and yeah. Uh, yeah. and it, it would have destabilized their chariots, knocked them over, everything. Um, sure. And this guy Ron Wyatt did these expeditions um, in the Gulf of Aqaba, and he found these amazing coral structures. Joe Rogan has talked about this a little bit on his show. Hmm. Uh, these coral structures that seem to be overgrowing these chariot wheels that that may have been from the Exodus. And so this ties into this lunar symbolism uh, in a really interesting way. It's very po possible that Moses uh, was using this land bridge. This is easier to see with a map, but essentially 
he knew the schedule of when the tides would go back and forth. And he led the Israelites to this place. And he said, if we cross here at this time, we'll be able to get outside of the boundaries of Egypt. And then the sea will close behind us and we'll have this separation between us and the Egyptian empire. Um, that makes total sense. And then just over time, a little bit of embellishment, a little bit of a legend, and it becomes he parted the sea and we walked across and it closed behind us. But exactly. Yeah, it, that makes yeah. Sense. yeah. So that's the naturalistic explanation. Mm. And it actually is kind of present in the word uh, for the Hebrew God, which is Yahweh. The etymology mm. of Yahweh is really interesting. So way means he blows in Hebrew and, and Yah is an is the egyptian uh term for the for the lunar goddess sin so yahweh means the moon blows i mean that's what it means in ancient hebrew so huh. yahweh is this deity that is is this lunar god that blew the tides in the imagination of the hebrews uh, uh to dis- decimate the egyptian army that was chasing them so there's these really interesting linguistic symbolic associations that that they are kind of buried in the old testament that are kind of hard to dig out but are really interesting when you kind of wow dig into no them a I'd, bit. I'd never heard that i'd never heard yeah. that as the etymology of yahweh that's fascinating it's really Th- this interesting. brings this brings me since we're talking about yahweh this brings me to a question i kind yeah. of had and I, I kind of wanted to hear your thoughts on so yeah um Okay, so the the notion is that the Israelites are eating manna in the desert, um, and that that Moses has eaten has eaten manna has eaten what we know as psilocybin mushrooms, and this has created uh, a, a period of religious vision. Uh, now, thousands of years later, we have Terence McKenna in La Chirera yeah. eating a bunch of mushrooms, and he and Dennis McKenna, his brother, which we talked about this in our main episode. They get, you know, I think I described it in the show as as high as anybody has ever been. Yeah, and, yeah, totally. And for weeks, for weeks, they are talking to the mushroom teacher, yep. which now makes me wonder, is that mushroom teacher the same? I, this is blasphemous, I know. But is that <laughs> mushroom teacher? <laughs> Maybe it's not blasphemous. Maybe Brad, Terrence didn't realize I got my what he rosary was doing. right here, buddy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You pray. Can you you pray it? those. Yeah. yeah. Pray yeah. Those. yeah. Keep me, yeah. Keep me yeah. safe. Yeah. But but I guess it, it it just it just raised the, the thought to me of like okay well well Terrence is out having this experience with a mushroom teacher who he believes is giving him le- giving him lessons and teaching him things, mm-hmm. and. If the Israelites, I mean, if some aspect of Christianity is is born out of these Israelites also having this experience, I mean, does that mean like Christians should be eating? I guess my point is, does that mean that Christians should be eating mushrooms if all of these things are true? Right. I'm doing my part. That's (laughs) (laughs) right, right, right. That's the, yeah, go, go, go. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, that's really it makes me think like okay if the religion was born out of this and you make a great case for it and i can't dispute it then it seems like christians ought to yes in in, in some way not freewheeling and and, you know maybe doing it in some kind of sacramental form but it seems like it it should be part of the practice now that's the crux of the argument that what you know if this stuff is real then Mm -hmm. you know psychedelics are really biblical fundamentalism in some capacity right right. i mean technically (laughs) speaking i mean that's the reality Um, you know just slap slap yeah it is you slap dark side of the moon on on vinyl you're hanging out with your 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 old lady you know you take a you take a dose i'm a Mm trad i'm trad yeah exactly that's that's the funny yeah there's a kind of funny uh thing about that yeah Mm -hmm. and um so that's that's a big part of the argument is that you know there's it seems that this was institutionally acceptable in the ancient Israelite tradition. And yeah, I think in the Christian tradition and is in the Islamic tradition as well. Yeah. There were rules yeah. about it, but um right, right. Well, yeah. and we see that too in 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 Terrence McKenna. This is something else, Terrence McKenna. This is everything I know about it. I think I learned from Terrence McKenna is the Ellicinian mysteries. Yes. It does seem that now this wasn't mushrooms, but it was the, the I think the current thinking is it was basically an LSD analog naturally occurring in rye smut. Right. Um, like like ergot. Um yes. that we talked about in the Bosch episode, Kevin. That's they were they were processing this in a way and 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 having this 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 
festival religious experience that everybody was supposed to go to um, at once one time in their life. And here you go, kid, eat this. You're going to get boshed. <laughs> what? <Yeah>. Trust <laughs> me. And, yeah. But then that would put it, I mean, that puts it, I don't know my dates very well, but this, this plants it at the, this plants it kind of at the base of all of the religions. Now, obviously the, obviously yeah. the Illicinian, the religion of the Illicinian mystery has either, uh, depending on how you look at it, disappeared or evolved. Um, but it's, there too and it's in moses it's it's in moses and it's in islam and so you know yes <laughs> it's it's everywhere and yeah i can actually yeah. touch on these points a little bit Please Elusinian do. mysteries yeah. so yeah. uh brian murescu who wrote the book um oh, what's it called i'm gonna I might blank on the uh, name here the immortality key I think? thank you you're right yeah. yes yep um and it, he talks about the Elusinian mysteries and he talks about this particular c character uh uh, Alcibiades, uh, who's a Greek uh, student of Socrates, actually. And he gets into trouble uh, with the Greek authorities because he starts hosting his own mysteries. So this gets into some of the rules that ancient societies had about this stuff. They wanted to kind of control it within a priesthood, who is allowed to take it, when they're allowed to take it, what the appropriate time is. Because I think the idea with these ancient people was that these were cognitive uh, enhancement drugs that would make you, uh, literally would make you more intellectually capable. And the idea was that you might be forming conspiracies in your secret proceedings um, and developing a new group mind and a new religion and a new it, deity. It's a big um, deal uh, when you change dungeon masters. Yes, it's, it's, really, it's, it's, it's a it. lot of yeah, a lot of responsibility. Yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. right, right. So yeah, so there was these rules around this, and Alcibiades. Basically, I think part of the reason he got exiled from Athens was because he was hosting these secret proceedings in his home, which was against the law in ancient Greece. Oh, um, interesting. So yeah, he had, he'd figured out how to cook it up or gotten his hands yep. on some, and was having like a dinner party or something and having, oh, that's yes. interesting. Yeah. And Socrates yeah. seems to have some indications of taking psychedelics. Uh, the whole mm. mythos around Socrates was that he created this rogue religion and that he had a daemon or a genie mm -hmm. that was guiding him and speaking to him and basically telling him what to do all the time. And it's one reason why the Greeks thought he was blessed by fortune is that he had like mm. an angel whispering in his ear. Um, like so Terrence have, McKenna's mushroom teacher. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah the logos perhaps <laughs> right. you know uh, it's, really right. it's it makes sense and uh, another aspect of the Ellisonian mysteries that does touch into the Bible a little bit is that um, the name that they use for the dr the ceremonial drink is the kikeon um, and Murarescu talks about this as well um, and this word actually does appear once in the in uh, I think it's in the Old Testament yeah um, hmm. uh, in the book of Jonah the story of Jonah and the whale um, hmm. so. When Jonah, uh, you know, he gets called by the Lord and he kind of freaks out and he says, look, I can't prophesy. I have to leave. And he gets on a ship to leave the call of the Lord that he's receiving or whatever. And he gets on the ship and they get, enter a storm and he gets thrown overboard because pe people say, oh, he's disobeying his God. So he's the bad luck. He's the reason why we have this storm. So we're going to throw him overboard. Superstitious time at that time. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, a whale picks him up and saves his life. And what's so interesting about this is that whales are like actually super intelligent. And there's stories of whales like protecting divers from sharks and stuff like this. Uh, and like just kind of like rolling around them and just keeping the sh and putting themselves in between these sharks and these divers. There's videos of this online. It's really kind of fascinating. Yeah, so yeah. Jonah was saved by this whale, brought back to the shore, uh, spat out, and what happens is apparently he has this kike on uh, this, which is, you know, and it, it's uh, the way they describe it is like that. It was like a gourd. I can't remember the exact uh, mm. phrasing of it off the top of my head, but that it was like a gourd and Allegro says that this was all mushroom symbolism, the kike on the uh -huh. gourd, and he gets a heavenly shade from this. And this is again, a, a going back to the mushroom symbolism again, but they use yeah. the Greek word because at this time, Jonah's probably close to somewhere like 600 BC, maybe somewhere in there. Okay. Um, okay. So you do have this, um, th this Greek word being used in the Bible. And so it wow. seems like there is this uh, inter 
mixing culture all across the Mediterranean that's using these hallucinogens, and they have a shared kind of temple worship culture that involves these psychedelics. And it's, it's, it's all over the place in the Greek histories, uh, in the Israelite histories. It's really kind of interesting. And there seems to be a kind of universalism behind it all. So fascinating. Now, yeah. here's my question, I guess. And we're kind of we're, we're nearing our, our hour um, as we head into our after dark where we're going to get uh, after darky talking about uh, psyops and so and psyops and psilocybin and silliness uh, right at, art of dark pod.com uh, patreon.com slash art of dark pod also yes. twitter follow us on twitter twitter.com slash art of dark pod for um, sure right for sure right you can harass brad on twitter yeah. and you gotta pay to harass me on patreon <laughs> right <laughs> right <laughs> That's the way um, to do but, it. I am yeah, the dungeon so. master. <laughs> <laughs> Adam. Oh man, no, well, I'm really enjoying this. This is amazing. I, Adam, very grateful that you came on. Brad, go oh, ahead. It's oh, fantastic. Really, no, yeah. glad to be here, and I really enjoy your guys' show. So thank you for having yeah, me. Yeah, thank, yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm glad. So th- this kind of leads into the, okay. So there's um, okay the Illusionian mysteries. Okay, we've got we've got pretty good. I'd say dang good evidence of psychedelic use, you know, at the, at the root of all of these religions. Now there's structure to it and there's rules. Why, where did it go? Why right. doesn't the Catholic church have a practice of, Hey, once every year, you know, you come to a thing and you guys all take, take mushrooms. What, where did it go? Why is it gone? Is there a theory behind that or thoughts behind that? Yeah. You know, it's, I think this one's a really op- really open to debate. I think the sure. Eucharist probably started out as a psychedelic ceremony. Those wafers are probably mushroom caps when when that tradition first started. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but then it got replaced with uh, alcohol in, in, in the form of wine, and um, mm-hmm. yeah. And so I think that's that, not a good trade. It, it, yeah, I don't know if that's trade. the best trade off. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. That's really not right. Yeah. Um, and I think there's also a good, I think there's a very good indication too. Um, I can touch on this briefly that that wine in the ancient Greek world was either you know as Murorescu states you know the ergot LSD mix, or it could have been a mushroom tea, uh, as well. Um, and I think a mushroom tea is very probable for one reason, uh, and it goes back to Homer and the Iliad and the Odyssey uh, w- when he talks about the ocean in in the Iliad and the Odyssey, he, he, he uses this lyrical device. He calls it the wine blue sea. Okay. And a lot of scholars have said, oh, well, the Greeks must've been colorblind because wine is red, right? It's, it comes from grapes. But mm-hmm. if the Greeks were using psilocybin mushrooms in their, in their wine, this, hmm. the staining effect of the psilocybin, the, the oxidizing mm-hmm. psilocin would have turned it blue. And the shade of blue of a mushroom tea, if you've ever brewed up a, a psilocybin mushroom tea, it looks like the Aegean Sea, the Greek Mediterranean mm, Ocean. Blue. It's a very clear blue color, you know? Oh, um, interesting. Yeah. So when Homer talks about the wine blue sea, he might be giving us information about the actual nature of Greek wine being psilocybin, uh, having psilocybin ingredients added to it. Wow. And wow. yeah, yeah, and it's really interesting. <laughs> and there is actually, there's one more thing that does tie back into the biblical stuff that I can just do real quick before we Please. go into the, the, yeah. the last hour here. Um, yeah. it, and that is the Parmenian wine in Homer's stories is they talk about there being cheese added to Parmenian wine, which is apparently the strongest stuff in the ancient Greek world. Mm. And this, this comes back to the ancient Israelite symbolism um, of milk and honey, actually. I th- my opinion that I've developed after looking at this stuff for a little while is I think that milk and honey or cheese and honey or curds and honey was actually a symbol of for psilocybin mushrooms. Uh, and the reason is that uh, the, the fleshy white stalks and the mycelial networks are very squishy, kind of mm. like cheese uh, or cottage cottage cheese or curds or cheese curds, whatever you'd want to call it. Mm-hmm. And it comes from cows, right? So mm-hmm. they have this linguistic association to cheese and curds and all this and milk. 
And then the honey part is the cap, which is this golden sunburst color that has this geometry on the underside. That's like yeah. a wild honeycomb, it, it, which it's, you know, it's, it's not always in those hexagonal shapes. Sometimes it's in these straight line patterns. So, sure. and, and bees have a kind of association that goes back to the Tassili and Nadjur, um, a cave painting that Terence McKenna depicted. Oh yeah. yeah. With the mushroom bee man that's painted in Algeria. So bees, and some people say, you know, bees can collect psilocybin mushrooms and actually make psychedelic tea. And they can do that with wow. other kinds of plants for sure. Um, so th this, there's these associations between bees, honey, milk, cattle, um, all kind of coalescing around this. And so when you see these weird references to cheese in religious literature, it may actually be an occult reference to, to psilocybin in some cases. Oh. Uh, yeah. And, <laughs> and when you get into the Israelite symbolism and you talk about the land of flowing with milk and honey, I think this is actually literally saying the land flowing with psilocybin mushrooms. And the reason that this was sacred land to the Israelites was that it was a natural habitat where mushrooms would just grow naturally and they couldn't cultivate it. They didn't know how to grow it themselves. So the only right. way for them to have access to these mushrooms was to own this kind of territory where their cattle yeah. would and the mushrooms would grow. Yeah. Yeah. Cause so. you can't just, it's not like an apples or something where the seeds and you plant them and they grow up. Yes. It's, it's, yeah. And they wouldn't have known that that process took a long time to figure out. Interesting. Right. So that's the, that's See, the kind land of, of milk and it. milk and honey always sounded weird to me because yeah. it's like, you can't live on that really. Yeah. Right. There's something like it's really I don't know, interesting. There, there's, I think, think there is that. an esoteric symbolism behind it. And mm. you can see it in Greek literature too. Carl Ruck actually touches on a few points of this um, in some of his writing. So, you know, you can find it in the Greek literature for sure. Um, and it's definitely present in the Israelite stories in multiple places. That's the, the milk and honey symbolism of Moses is just one spot. Yeah. So, right. yeah. Right. So that's that kind of I think sums up a lot of the symbolism that you see there, and it just gives you a new angle on this tradition that paints it as this is a continuation of Terence McKenna's uh, nomadic hunter gatherer society that he talked about that lived in a partnership relationship with cattle, mushrooms, and kind of venerated fertility and sex. You know, uh, mm -hmm. God's promise to Abraham was that he's going to you know have lots of kids, I and mean, we know how kids are made, so you know that's part of the right. whole. <laughs> the whole religious sentiment is this kind of, you know, really it's this 1960s drug, sex, and rock and roll sentiment of this culture. And you really see it reemerge over and over again when you're paying attention and you're looking for it in the Bible. It starts to make sense of this culture in a really right. interesting way. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Adam, wow. how do yeah, you yeah. get to Carnegie Hall? How do you get to Practice. Carnegie Hall? practice <laughs> that's that's how you get a lot of kids be practice. fruitful and multiply <laughs> right right got it got it yeah yep. just just like the mushrooms yes. Adam, yes give us your plugs we're going to come back for the patreon subscribers we're going to talk about mckenna the three letter agencies we're going to do our own little mini arrowid so please sign up if you get in during 2022 you can get in at three bucks otherwise it's going to go up to five it's gonna it's gonna get as high as I am right now. <laughs> right. <laughs> those love it, those love are it. coming up, baby. It's coming yeah. up. Uh, but look, you know, look, if, if you think the show is worth five bucks, three bucks, five, whatever, chuck us something. We put the work in, we get we get you brilliant guests like our friend Adam, this this oh, erudite thanks. independent scholar, legitimately fascinating ideas. Oh, he's he's giving great. you a free book. Hopefully, I mean, you know, Adam, we're gonna we're gonna keep talking about uh hallucinogenics periodically on the show. So maybe one day you'll come back. But oh, give yeah. us give us your plug. Give us your plugs for sure. Well, right now it's just Twitter uh, at Aeon Animus, the the pun on anonymous. Hopefully, we can put a text version somewhere around yeah, there. Yeah, we will have a yeah. link for sure. Yep. Okay. It'll yep. it'll be in the show notes. Uh, yeah. Fabulous. Please and go the check pinned, out his the, book. Mm -hmm. right now anyway. The pinned tweet is the link direct link to the book that that we've been talking about. So that's right. I mean, folks, give it give it a look. I mean, it's. It's 578 pages. I know that sounds like a lot. Like, oh, <laughs> yeah. it's this dense ear. But but it's actually it's it's quite well laid out. There's a lot of pictures that you, that you can look at for for those of you who are Thanks. are semi literate. <laughs> but no, it's right. it's really well done. And it <laughs> steps you, you through. It steps you through the Bible. It, it, and it reminded me. I mean, you've got the Bible verses right there, and then it 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 makes the point very very well. So I think it's Thank useful you. for anybody to have in their. Uh, you know, if you're like Kevin and I, you have several hundred 
PDFs that you've pulled <laughs> yep. from places. This certainly I, should be one of them that you have. I have so, an, an entire hard drive dedicated to manifestos. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> keep that in the Faraday yep. cage. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. Brilliant, <laughs> Adam. So much fun. Thanks. Let's come back in a little bit, do another 30 minutes uh, on the After Dark. Really enjoyed this, Brad. Lots of fun, buddy. Crushing it. Uh, I cannot wait. And just remember, remember guys, practice. Yeah, keep Appreciate practicing. You. Appreciate you too, man. All right, talk to you in a bit.